Trucks have come to dominate the roadways of the United States and Canada with the number one selling vehicle in the US being the Ford F-150. However, it wasn't always like this, so why is everyone all of a sudden jumping on the truck wagon? Trucks have been pretty much a thing since the beginning of the entire auto industry. The first ever internal combustion engine truck was built by a German in 1896, but the American truck really got started with the release of the oh-so-famous Ford Model T in 1908. This Model T was the earliest automobile designed specifically so that regular people could actually own one. However, add a few planks of wood and some iron from the blacksmith to the back of it, and you had a suddenly very functional truck to do all of your truck stuff with. Eventually, Ford would release their own version of this truck, the Model TT, back in 1917. Basically, the Model TT was just an extended Model T with a bed in the back. And a year later, Chevrolet would join the truck game and the race was on. Now these early trucks were super bare bones. You had a place to sit, a place to put your stuff, and a motor to haul it up the hill. These trucks were, quote, as humble as the folks who drove it. But those humble beginnings started to fade when television became a thing alongside post-World War II prosperity. Suddenly the truck guy image started manifesting itself with the help of TV commercials, emphasizing the utter ruggedness and strength of these vehicles that could stand basically anything you could throw at it. What power there is here? What ruggedness? But the hype wouldn't reach the average suburban city worker for decades to come. No, 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 no. These early trucks were functional, yes, but they weren't exactly sexy. They were designed with a more rugged purpose in mind. If you didn't need to regularly haul a bunch of equipment or logs or manure or what have you across uneven terrain or even mountain tops, this would probably be a lot less comfortable than just buying a regular sedan with all the modern luxuries that sleek new cars of the time had. But then something happened that totally shook the auto world in an unexpected and kind of ironic way. For many of you watching, you probably already know what I'm talking about. It's the 1973 OPEC embargo. To oversimplify a very far-reaching historic event, here's the gist of what happened. Oil-producing countries attack Israel. Nixon backs Israel. The states don't get any more oil. Oil prices skyrocket. Obviously, there is a lot more to it than that, but the OPEC, or the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries, stopped sending oil to the United States, and American gas shortages became a major, major problem for basically the first time ever. Worldwide oil prices quadrupled within six months. In the States, gas stations often didn't even have enough to supply their customers and were forced to ration and turn people away. Massive line were forming around the places that still had fuel and this just meant that everything sucked for people who relied on oil and gas which is of course basically everybody now I know things are pretty uh how, how do we keep saying it unprecedented but you have to understand that back then things weren't unprecedented all the time for the most part people didn't even know that the phrase fuel efficiency applied to the massive vehicles they were driving at the time oil prices were fairly consistent and gasoline was readily available until this point so you drove pretty much whatever you wanted and it didn't matter how much gas it drank until it did and then it really mattered. Right through the 60s into the 70s, American car manufacturers just kept building bigger, more powerful cars that used more fuel. And it's crazy to think that the first ever car, the Model T, got 21 miles per gallon, and by the 70s, a Ford Mustang was getting around 10. The embargo marked a key turning point in the auto industry. Suddenly, it really, really mattered how efficient a car was, and consumers started gravitating towards towards smaller cars that didn't cost an arm and a leg to fuel up, which, weirdly, actually resulted in more trucks being sold. Let me explain. This whole OPEC embargo thing only lasted like half a year, but in that short amount of time, it totally shifted the way people thought about fuel and paved the way for government regulations on the matter. Just a few years later in 1975, the American government passed the Energy Policy and Conservation Act in response to that fateful embargo. This included a set of standards to regulate fuel consumption called 
half hay. Corporate average fuel economy. This meant that auto manufacturers were forced to follow this regulation as of 1978, and it basically just meant that they made smaller cars, but not smaller trucks. See, under CAFE, not all vehicles were treated equally. Only passenger cars were affected, so while sedan manufacturers were forced to fixate on fuel and scramble to find ways to accommodate these standards, those in the truck business were free to build basically whatever they wanted. Then, in 1980, fuel standards applied to light trucks up to 6,000 pounds, and then they included vehicles up to 8,500 pounds the year after that. But even then, passenger cars have always had stricter standards with large vehicles freer to consume more gas. But then oil prices started getting cheaper and shortages became less of a thing, particularly during the 1980s oil glut and consumers didn't have to be quite as obsessive about whether or not their cars sucked on gas. In the 1980s, two things really started to become popular. Spandex workout clothes and big vehicles. Now it's not just that trucks can obviously hold more cargo and are better with rough terrain and weather conditions and whatnot, but they also last longer. Without the cramped engines of their sedan counterparts, trucks tend to be better built and more durable, not to mention easier to work on. Because of this, they depreciate less, making them more desirable as an investment. Now, obviously, before you go to the comments, not all trucks are built well. There are terrible examples of trucks that just fall apart. But in theory, trucks should be more reliable. It is understandable why trucks are appealing. But like most things that happen in the United States, truck interest is not just like an interest, it's like an American interest. Truck culture is real. The Ford F-150 is featured regularly in country music. All I ever needed was an F-150. They get customized and modified like a prize pup at a dog show. And according to a Ford survey, 15% of Ford owners have their truck or something related to their truck tattooed on their body. There are actual stories of Ford owners selling their firstborn to keep their truck in repossession cases. Okay, now that last one was a lie, but it almost got you, right? They stoked this growing desire for such a profitable item, largely by making them sexier and more appealing to a broader audience. In 1994, a Dodge Ram redesign was released that would change the face of the truck industry forever. This new look was supposed to make the truck approachable to more people, and to me, this is absolutely nuts. When it comes to full-size pickups, the rules have changed. All Dodge did was just change the appearance of the Ram somewhat, modeling it loosely after big rig trucks apparently, and that was enough to double Ram sales that year and quadruple them in the decade coming after that. Now sure this sounds like kind of a one-off, but to this day basically all major truck brands have been inspired at least in part by this seminal 1994 model. Never let it be said the looks don't matter, because they often are what makes and breaks these trends, and in this case helped pave the way for trucks to be ingrained into American life. From that point forward, trucks kept getting bigger faster and filled with technology to appeal to every possible person. And yes, we have got what we like to call the Arcteryx effect on our hands in which a product with a specialized kind of functionality gets adopted by mainstream culture purely for the image associated with it. There was a time when trucks were for off-roading, stashing your tools, or snow plowing your driveway. And now a truck means something completely different. I know people are going to get mad, but ultimately it is a status symbol to own the biggest and baddest vehicle on the block, even if you're just driving it to your office job downtown. There is just something about driving a big truck that makes a person feel tough and rugged, and the bigger the better. However you look at it, the truck is a cultural icon, a tool, and a social status symbol that has taken over the United States. Just last month from the time that we wrote this script, five out of the top 10 vehicles sold in the United States were all pickups, including the top three 
and sedan popularity has been going down for decades. In 2000, sedans made up 40% of vehicle sales, and by 2020, that went down to 18%. In 2021, light trucks, a category that includes SUVs, crossovers, pickups, and vans, accounted for a whopping 75% of the market. If you look around, it is easy to think that perhaps the days of the Toyota Corolla are behind us. Will it stay this way? As history has taught us, the popularity of a vehicle isn't merely based on what consumers need, but factors that are way beyond most of our control. Oil prices, industry regulations, and cultural fads carry with them the potential to totally overhaul a market in very unpredictable ways. One president's decision in a war 50 years ago changed the auto industry forever, and I don't think that I need to remind you of what's going on today, because you have a phone or a device of some sort because you're watching this video and it's impossible to avoid. We're recording this in 2022 and gas prices are on the rise and they might just keep going up. So we may see a shift in what people expect from a vehicle. These kinds of economic downturns can make us rethink what we actually need. Smaller, lighter cars may look a lot more appealing one or two years from now. And maybe that shifts a whole generation of people to different kinds of vehicles. But don't think that the auto manufacturers don't also know this. Last year, Hyundai and Ford released unibody compact trucks that have done pretty well. They're smaller, lighter, and better on gas than the classic body-on-frame builds of bigger trucks, and they still carry that rugged cowboy sort of aesthetic. More polarizing, though, is the release of EV trucks, like the Ford F-150 Lightning, the Rivian, and of course, the Tesla Cybertruck that may never actually hit the roads because who knows what the hell is ever going on with Tesla. These electric trucks are here to satisfy the demand for truck stuff while still giving us that eco-friendly stamp of approval, now, I'm not gonna get into the issues with the EV industry or the irony of EV trucks as a solution to climate change. Maybe that's a subject for a different video, but hopefully this video was enjoyable for you. If you did enjoy it, make sure you like it, make sure you subscribe to the channel, and if you are, then we'll see you in the next one. God, the comments on this one are gonna be brutal.